All right, hello everybody, welcome. My name is Steve. This is the BISC brief call for September 5th. Um, topic for this call is going to be bootstrapping new markets. So we're gonna discuss strategies first with uh, folks who've done it. So we've got uh, Felix and Wiz who I would say successfully have gotten some, uh, some markets started on BISC. And so we'll, we'll talk to them about strategies they used, what worked, what didn't work, lessons learned, things like that, uh, to, give you, to give you guys a, a basis of how to think about this. And then we'll take questions. Hold on, slides here. The questions from those of you looking to bootstrap markets in your own localities, in your own regions, um, discuss those if we can offer you some advice. And, and then talk about from a BISC perspective, how to get started. If you, if you do have ideas, chances are your market is going to be a little bit different or maybe very different from markets that we've uh, bootstrapped in the past. Um, and, but in spite of that, there are some, um, tools we can offer in the way of, um, analytics, connections to people, uh, things like that, uh, introductory materials. Uh, to help you get started, um, so we'll, we'll go we'll go over some of that as well. So um, to get started, I guess well, let me first share my screen so that you can see the plan for the call. I'm hoping to keep this call 30 to 40 minutes. I know that's probably a bit ambitious given the uh, the goals here, but I I'd like to keep as close to that as possible so that we keep the call from meandering from people who watch it later from getting bored. So um, try to do that. Let's see, share screen. Okay, if you, you, should, you should be seeing a, a slide. If you, don't, if you don't see it, let me know. Uh, bootstrapping new markets. Uh, so like I said, we're gonna talk about first what's worked, then take questions from those of you on the call who have questions on uh, what's, what was talked about and maybe questions on approaches that you've thought about and then talk about how to get started practically what can you do and what can the BISC network offer you in the way of help so if we could I'd like to start out by talking about uh, markets that we've already bootstrapped if um, correct then uh, Felix had a big hand in starting the USD and euro markets uh, in the past, and Wiz recently has helped a lot with bootstrapping the JPY market in Japan with some success there. Um, so I wanted to see if we could just start out high level and talk a little bit about the key ingredients for you. So what, what was instrumental in, in, in starting the markets that, that you were involved with? Um, right, so so I wouldn't I wouldn't claim credit for bootstrapping euro or dollar. That's been around for a long time on BISC, but uh, but we did help push liquidity along a bit. We did some some liquidity events and some things to try and and help increase the liquidity. But the the key thing for new markets is always well, someone has to take the leap, right? Uh, someone has to take the leap and place the first offers. And there's little incentive to do so if there's nobody else there. There's very little incentive to uh, you know just waste your time and pay the the transaction fees to place your offer and keep your Bitcoin on escrow for a for an offer if you don't know that anybody's going to take it. So it's always the challenge is always that first step. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in reality, you can't just do it with one person because then that person is going to place his offers and be waiting around for a long time. So the f most key, if I had to pick one thing that makes bootstrapping a new market uh, possible is you have to start with several people, right? You have to start mm -hmm. with the community. Uh, it takes two to trade. So at least two people who are already trading Bitcoin, who are already using, uh, already know the, the basics and who are just willing to, try out BISC for a certain new market and both do the first trade and do a bit of testing and see what doesn't work, if there's anything missing, if the payment methods that are used in the country, anyway. Yeah. 
you, you need some, at least two people to take a step forward, uh, agree to, to try it out, and then work up from there and see what can be improved. Sure. So I would say, Wiz, that's probably something you guys, you had the, great, the right idea to begin with. You, uh, as I understand, are one of the organizers of, the, uh, of, a, of, a, of a big meetup in, in Tokyo. Yeah, so uh, that's true. I do uh, organize the Tokyo Bitcoin meetup. And uh, right now, that's actually the only Bitcoin meetup in Tokyo. So um, that's where all the non-scammer people kind of hang out. And uh, yeah, I, I think um, when we first, that's actually how I first started uh, getting into BISC and started contributing is that uh, local Bitcoin shutdown as you guys know, and uh, when they stopped doing the cash trades, all the members of the meetup were kind of coming to me as the organizer and saying, hey, do you know anybody who wants to buy or anybody who wants to sell? And so I just tweeted out like, hey, is there like some kind of Excel sheet, like Google Docs uh, Excel sheet would almost be perfect just to kind of have a or offer book, right? Um, but, uh, you know, then I think uh, someone said, well, why don't you use BISC? Because that's basically like the most awesome thing ever and I was like what and uh, I had used BISC actually BitSquare uh, a couple years back um, you know just to trade some uh, random shit coins and whatnot but anyway like uh, this is uh, the first time I had heard of BISC in the modern uh, time and uh, basically uh, the first thing you guys said is okay we'll offer a bounty for uh, market makers and liquidity and okay cool uh, so, you know, me and maybe like one or two other people, we just start doing some orders around, but, uh, you know, we get a little bounty, which is cool for us, but for the most part, nobody really cares. They're like, oh, okay, this cool, whatever. But uh, they're going to go back to using our centralized exchanges, whatever. And so that's why I kind of put together this, uh, very, uh, quick list. Uh, since you have your, uh, screen presenting, would you mind pulling up the, uh, agenda? I just commented on your agenda. Oh. Um, yeah, sure. Kind of like my one slide, uh, if you have it handy. But basically, um, I kind of came up with like 10 easy steps of the correct order of how I think it should be done for any new market. And it, exactly like what uh, Steve just said, the most important thing is to have people on the ground, multiple people on the ground, like a community that are ready to, uh, ready to do it. So... Um, Obviously, uh, BISC found me, and there's a few other core organizers of the meetup um, who are basically going to become the ambassadors on the ground in Japan to help launch the JPY order book. And this is really critical because we have the stage to kind of present BISC to everyone and explain it to them and educate them and make them feel comfortable. Maybe not right away, but over the course of several months with lots of live demo trades and liquidity parties and, and uh, additional things, uh, it's possible. And so I, I think we actually kind of made a mistake doing the market maker liquidity bounty first because nobody really uh, felt comfortable enough to start playing around with it. So I think that was kind of early or premature. What I think the correct steps are now, which um, we're still not completely finished with, is uh, localizations, right? So if you're gonna start a new market in an English-speaking country, this is obviously a lot easier for you since you don't need to translate the app or whatever. So this is more specific to Japan, but Japanese people um, don't speak English um, or they don't speak it well enough to feel comfortable using an English app to put real money on there where they might screw up and lose their money. And um, there's also other, other forms of localization uh, such as the local payment method. So in Japan, we have this really awesome uh, banking system where you can just pay you know, my bank actually gives me free bank transfers and 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, I can instantly transfer money to anybody else's bank account for free. So, wow. uh, of course, yeah, I know, right? It's like, why doesn't the rest of the world have that? But, uh, you know, obviously this is going to be the critical uh, way to trade with BISC in Japan. Also, face-to-face -face trades with cash are uh, also very high demand. But, um, so, translating the... BISC desktop app itself into Japanese and 
adding this uh, Japanese bank transfer payment method. I'm actually, um, the, tr the, the app translations we finished and we got into the last release, the uh, Japan bank uh, transfer payment method, I'm trying to get into this release, but it's not 100% uh, ready yet. Uh, you know, so we're still not even done with that. And then the next step, which is also still in progress, is about 70% done right now, or 75% done, is localizing the BISC website into Japanese. Um, I have most of it done. Um, you know, it's mostly just the same thing, translating strings, maybe tweaking images here and there a little bit. And then uh, the next step is the YouTube videos that, I don't know if you're familiar with, Kiss Bitcoin uh, made some yeah. really awesome uh, YouTube videos about BISC. And, um, what we want to do is just add subtitles so that we can kind of uh, in the future plan, uh, you know, just play these YouTube videos at the uh, uh, meetup group or send them around or whatever, because people always like to study on their own after the meetup. It was like to do their own research. Uh, I noticed a lot of people actually started playing with BISC after like the day after the meetup, it started making offers and stuff, which is really cool. But only the foreigners who are familiar to, uh, you know, in native English speakers, none of the Japanese guys were kind of doing it. So I feel after we add these localizations then they'll feel more comfortable. Gotcha. And then of course, after the localization of desktop app, after the localization of the payment methods, uh, after the localization of the website and the YouTube videos, then you can take all that, uh, now Japanese content and actually present it on stage, do some live demo trades, uh, you know, show them the website, show them the videos, you know, maybe not go into full detail since you don't have so much time on the stage, but enough to kind of spark their interest. And then when they go home, they're going to go and watch those videos or read the website or, you know, maybe try and do some, uh, they're going to download the app on their own. And I think that's really critical. Um, giving people kind of homework to do after the meetup, to do their own research at home. And then only at that point, after everything has been localized and everyone feels kind of comfortable enough in their own native language to play around with it, then you can uh, you know, offer a bounty for liquidity market makers and throw an actual uh, liquidity party you know, at the next meetup event or something like this. And you can hold some promotion, like, okay, if you trade on BISC, well, you know, you get a free drink at the bar or uh, you know, you could just hand out some BSQ uh, so that everyone, um, you know, has has it in there. Uh, you don't have to pay trading fees. You know, just little little things to kind of uh, spark their interest. And uh, after that actual launch day, what we plan to do now is using the new um, website analytics that we just set up, uh, kind of track, you know, how much how much traffic from Japan how that starts to ramp up and, and kind of monitor it, how it's going. And then after that, do like continuous education because there's always going to be, you know, points of confusion. Um, people are always going to make mistakes or have, you know, they're going to screw it up. So, that, so we got to kind of do this uh, continuous cycle of, okay, you know, this guy had this issue, just teach everyone. Okay. So don't make the same mistake. This guy, you know, do this. And then you could kind of scale it up from there. And hopefully by that point you have, a critical mass of liquidity where you always have at least one or two bids on the offer book and one or two asks on the offer book. And that's really, uh, I think enough to kind of get it started. Right. And then, um, as this new Bitcoin bull market cycle, uh, kind of roars to life, hopefully the market will just organically, you know, spark from there and, uh, we can kind of guide it larger and larger. But yeah, I think that's, the 10 steps that we should kind of probably use as a base structure for any new market. Um, localization is key. I, I, I have to say uh, was that uh, the first step has to be the most important because if you don't, if you don't have people on the ground interested in doing all the rest, you will get nowhere with it. You will get nowhere with localization because you know you can't you can't know what's going on from the other end of the world, and you can't sort out the payment methods. You can't do the of course you can't do the translation without people, um, local people. So finding solid ambassadors. Uh, just if if you have a minute, Steve, I I like to talk about some of the mistakes and some of the failures that we've had in the past because we've. Okay. Um, yeah. Over the, over the past uh, two years, we've tried launching India. We've tried mm -hmm. launching Mexico. Well, I've, I've tried uh, launching Russia, and I've several times I've tried to launch China. And the one critical 
thing that was always missing was having solid people on the ground who were interested, who, who all already knew most of the stuff, not necessarily about BISC, but about Bitcoin, and who'd already done trades on local Bitcoins or centralized markets or other platforms. Uh, so for example, in Mexico, I got a friend of mine to, you know, try and be a market maker for a couple of months. And, uh, and Manfred managed to get another friend of his to try and take the first few offers. But uh, they weren't people, at least my friend wasn't someone who was very interested in the whole Bitcoin thing. So, you know, they did it for a little while, they had fun, whatever, and then they just gave up and never came back. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in India, for example, I actually went on to uh, freelancer.com and hired some people to be market makers on my, you know, on my own uh, money, just as an experiment to see if it would work. And even worse of an experience, at least my friend, you know, put it in the effort for a month. But the, the, the guys I uh, contracted out to, to try and start the market, they just did the minimum, the absolute minimum to get paid and really had no, no real interest. Right. Uh, China. I tried several times with several people, um, I, with people who had done Bitcoin trading, who are in China and some in Hong Kong, and they, uh, they, they, uh, they just were not interested in decentralized markets. They just said, hey, look, I, we're happy doing OTC, but they tried it. They tried it, right? But they, uh, after they tried it for a bit, they said, okay, but uh, the payment methods, uh, and we're not sure about the regulation and and they end up going back to traditional otc telegram channels and wechat channels where they traded with people they knew right yeah. um so and i i still haven't cracked what's missing in china for people to take the lead by the way there are some orders some bids and asks in yuan right now so someone is trying but it's just one person, right? So, so unless some more people are attracted to it. Anyway, so, so there's many ways to do it wrong, and we've tried a lot of them. But the one thing, wherever, whenever I've seen it actually work, it's been because there was someone there on the ground with real interest, and Brazil is a great example, and obviously Jap Japan's a great example as well. Yes, yeah, so you mentioned China real quick. If I could just uh, put in a few words. So... I um, actually was in China uh, a month or two ago, and um, I met with uh, one of the top OTC traders there. And uh, he is uh, he's very, uh, you know, hardcore trader. I think he just does it full time and, uh, you know, like on huge volume even. So he's very, very interested to start market making with BISC. You know, he has a huge amount of Bitcoin capital to throw at this. Uh, but he can't, he can't get BISC to work in China. It's just like, uh, you know, even if he's going to be the ambassador, so to speak, we have to fix this uh, tour. You know, basically, there is no internet access in China, right? They have an intranet with very limited censored links to the actual global internet. Yeah, and but there are workarounds. Because I, I was in China last year and I tried connecting from several different places with VPN, without VPN, from a hotel, from a uh, local Chinese place. You can actually get it to work. So if there is interest and there's people there testing things, we can find solutions. And sure, this I'm sure we can do more with tall bridges and we can find the tech solution. But the thing about China is that you set up a workaround and then they close they close it down, right? You set up tall bridges or relays or whatever, and they keep getting closed. So you always have to be looking for a workaround. And there are. Many of them have been working for a long time. But you need someone who's willing to test it and to try it first. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, like you said, if, if we don't have someone there, like if you don't have a BISC contributor who's going to work on this full time with us, it's very hard. And uh, yeah. yeah, maybe like if, if we could get a meetup organizer to uh, partner with us, something like that. Yeah. So both of you guys, uh, Felix, you, you seem to allude to it, and, and Wiz, you, you mentioned it quite a bit, the importance of making the software, translating the software, the website, making videos available as well uh, to help educate people. My, my question is, before you even get to that point, to really spark the interest of people in BISC, how do you do it? Because BISC is a very complicated thing. It's, it, there's a lot to explain 
do you do you do you try to explain all the ways bisque is different or do not you all the ways not all the ways but steve the thing is the, the interest is going to be there we, we are seeing what's happening with local bitcoins uh ramping up the kyc and probably right. blocking blocking cash payments and blocking soon probably a lot of countries because of the Finnish regulation they're going to block most of africa and half of latin america probably so the interest is going to be there if we can just channel it and get it organized before it goes somewhere else so over the next six months i'm certain that there's going to be a lot of people trying bisc out um we just have to you know make sure that they don't they don't hit a wall like this is too complicated and they just give up immediately and and the the advantages for me are clear privacy which everyone is becoming more sensitive to uh lately uh mm -hmm. privacy security you're not hold, having another a third party hold your funds uh it's all in your own wallet be it BISC or external and under your control and the control of the user. And of course, censorship resistance, which is a big, big deal in many of these countries we're talking about. Argentina is imposing capital controls again. Uh, China, we know all the problems there are. There are many countries uh, where, you know, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges of Bitcoin are going to come under heavy regulation. And in many places, BISC is going to be one of the only options. So, I. I I know we're not ready to scale to meet all that demand yet. I, I'm not hoping for that much. I'm just hoping to, you know, create a, a firm community that's willing to make the effort, try, start using it, discover the advantages, and then we can build on that. Actually, so that's a really good point. Um, we did a presentation called Why Bisc? And exactly like you mentioned security privacy and freedom were the three main points of the presentation because obviously that's what everything in the whole world basically boils down to and the problem with japan specifically is that uh we don't have any uh security risks here with the exception of uh, a hacked bitcoin exchange once in a while um nobody really values their privacy because they have privacy and nobody really values their freedom because censorship and you know capital controls are not an issue in Japan. So yeah, why the hell would I want to use this BISC app when I could just go on a centralized exchange like Bitflyer? I can wire money there in one minute, have it in my account ready to trading, buy Bitcoin, withdraw the Bitcoin, and ten minutes later have the Bitcoin in my Bitcoin. Why would I ever want to use BISC, which is slow? You know, like you you know, there's a lot of uh, the UX is just obviously never going to be as good as that for a decentralized system it can, and so it you can kind of have to pretty good it can get pretty good i mean what once you're using instant payment methods like faster payments in the uk i think we can get the ux to be quite good i mean not not as good as doing a few fast trades on a centralized exchange but as but better than having to deposit bitcoin in a centralized exchange wait for the confirmations do a trade and then having to uh, uh, take the Bitcoin out and wait for the confirmation. We can beat that, I think, with this. Sure, but but even if the UX is just as good or even a little bit better, I don't really know BISC. Uh, I rather trust this local Japanese company that's approved by the Japanese government. I feel very comfortable. If there's a problem, they'll bail me out. You know what I mean? Like, there's there's an infinite amount of arguments uh, why they would much rather use the centralized exchange over BISC. And so I found the key point of, I don't even talk about BISC. I just talk about security, privacy, and freedom. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, guys, sure, you could, you could use a centralized exchange, but what happens if, you know, Mt. Gox happens again and you lose all your holdings? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. Or actually, um, did you hear Japan is changing their laws and they're going to increase the... Uh, they're going to introduce this new law where all of crypto capital gains are now 50% tax holdings. It's like, oh, yeah, that's a really good point. Or actually, um, Monero is illegal in Japan. Do you want to buy? If you want to buy Monero, there's actually no option for the centralized exchange. BISC is the only option. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's a really good point. And then it's kind of obvious that BISC is this actually legitimately useful thing. And then you can kind of seduce them into trying it out and, you know what I mean? Because they're always very emotional about 
no, I'll just use my bank account and you know, I'll just do my uh, KYC and my ID selfie and I feel very safe with that. So obviously this is very specific to Japan. You know, it's a very, very developed country. Uh, if you go to South America, Central America, they're going to have different opinions about trusting the government or trusting the banking system. And so I, I guess you kind of have to tailor the arguments to the locals. Like when you, when you talk about China, for example, you know, they, they think if, you're, if, you, if you speak to like a mainland China person, the average person loves a Chinese government. And they, they think that the West, that, you know, Google is bad and Baidu is good and, and all these things. So um, how about Hong Kong? You know, yeah, that's a, that's a whole other discussion um, <laughs> off topic. But you get, you get my point is that you really have to tailor the security, privacy, freedom arguments to the local. Like if you went to Venezuela, I'm sure it's already obvious to them that they shouldn't trust the government to, uh, you know, not debase their currency. So they already want Bitcoin, obviously. So it's a, it's a much easier sell if you go to a country like that, right? You have different issues. Where... Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, I think wherever Bitcoin is big is where BIS should be big. I think that's why we're seeing a lot of uh, organic interest in uh, countries with not so great geopolitical uh, situations. Um, all right, Wait, that was a that was a great foundation. Thank you guys for uh, for all of that, um, all of those insights. Um, anybody on the call have any questions so far? If not, if you could just put in a quick line in the chat of maybe what you're interested in, if you're interested in a particular market, making a particular market, or helping out with an existing market, or just generally what you're looking to get out of the call. Um, Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Matt Allboard. I'm a data scientist. I've been looking at local Bitcoins and Paxful for a couple of years. Um, I also, you guys, have a data set on coin.dance as well. So I've noticed you guys uh, for a while as well. I wanted to ask a question to Felix. He said that uh, local Bitcoins was probably gonna cut off uh, large swaths of Africa and Latin America. Um, what, uh, what makes you think that that's gonna happen? Uh, because that's what the European regulation basically does to exchanges. If you, um, if you want to be a regulated exchange in Europe, you basically can't serve any African countries because that's, that's immediately going to put you in uh, top tier risk for AML and counterterrorism. Uh, sorry, counterterrorism finance. So, so uh, why are they already allowed to do it? What is changing there that's going to... No, no, no. The, the only thing that's changing is that regulators are looking at them more strictly and, you know, calling them up and telling them that they have to change the, the terms of service. And they already, I mean, they already gave up on Germany because the German regulation was quite strict about these types of things. Uh, and they being, they being, I mean... Believe me, I think local Bitcoins has done an amazing job. Uh, I actually did some stuff with the Kangas brothers to promote Bitcoin in Africa, uh, uh, sponsored by local Bitcoins. And, you know, they've done an amazing job, but they've grown big enough that they've attracted the attention of regulators. And regulators think they have a lot to say about peer-to-peer -peer transactions of cryptocurrency. And, uh, you know, they, they, they're going to have to make a choice. And for them... Just as for almost any other exchange, Europe and the U.S. are a much bigger deal than in money terms than the rest of the world. So if they have to comply with European regulations, uh, AML and KYC and so on, they have to, for example, start asking for a national ID. And they can't accept any identification which is not issued by government. Well, that's going to put a lot of unbanked people in Africa out of local bitcoins. Another example: if they start asking for a for a proof of address that's issued by an official utility company, well, a lot of people in Latin America and Africa pay cash for the utility bills. They are not going to have, uh, you know, a proof of uh, address they can use like that. Um, another typical thing is asking for a bank account. If you want to trade more than X amount of money. They're going to ask for a proof of funds, a source of funds document. And guess what? 
all the unbanked people in Africa who don't have a bank account are not going to be able to meet those terms. So even though they haven't announced anything like this, it's, it's going to happen. And we've already seen them give up on the, on the cash, face-to-face -face cash payments because of these types of regulations. And as things progress over the next year, uh, they are going to have to give up on a lot more. Yeah, I, I, I agree with your general sentiment that, um, you know, I'm not a lawyer and I don't live in Europe, but I agree with your general sentiment that regulators are looking a lot more closely at local Bitcoins. But I don't think um, I would be moderately surprised if they were to have to do full KYC AML on um to the extent that they they have they don't have the capability to on all of their Latin American and African customers, I think um, you know that that is the the lion's share of their volume, and I think they can make a good argument that uh, they should um, they should allow this type of um, trading to keep to keep going on. So um, yeah, no, they, they, believe me, they want to. I mean, these guys are they've been in Bitcoin for a long time. Uh, Jeremy is. These guys, the Kangas brothers, they really believe in Bitcoin, but they have liability. They have a company. They have employees. They are based in Finland. They're going to have to comply with European regulations. Uh, another example, not the same, not a P2P market, but uh, uh, you probably know about Shapeshift. Hey, mm -hmm. Eric Voorhees was absolutely adamant that he was going to build a business model that was not going to be crippled by regulation. And that was not going to require opening an account and doing KYC. Well, guess what? The regulators thought differently. And even though he had the best lawyers, he spent a lot of money designing something that complied with regulation without requiring the giving up on privacy. By the time, you know, when they got big enough, they got called and they, they got told, look, we're going to sue you. We're going to shut you down unless you do this. And once you have employees, once you have a company, you have a responsibility that forces you to do things a certain way that, uh, you know, maybe a true decentralized market doesn't have to. Yeah, I'll, I'll just put in one last comment on that. There's a difference between uh, like a Venezuelan person doing KYC with their own government uh, versus with local Bitcoins, which is based in Finland. Um, I think by and large, most people in Venezuela would have absolutely zero problem doing KYC AML with jurisdictions outside of their own. And so even if these exchanges start to implement that type of uh, policy, I think, um, I mean, you are right about the unbanked not being able to provide documents, but I, I still think that the vast majority of these developing country traders, they do have uh, the minimum amount of base documents to do KYC AML with these uh, with these local Bitcoins types, and they don't care one bit that their ID sits on a database in Finland. Um, yeah, that, that's all I have. Um, hey guys, um, Anthony here, Adiba03. I'm actually calling in from Nigeria. Uh, this is my first time on the call. Um, can you guys hear me? Just, I just want Hi. to confirm I'm not, yeah, yeah. awesome. Uh, so first things first, uh, first um, Felix, you made some very valid points. I've uh, been on uh, local Bitcoins for a while as well. Um, I was a late bloomer in the cryptocurrency world. And so um, I haven't been on there too long, just about four years, uh, four years thereabout. Um, so first things first, the present level of security uh, with local Bitcoins includes... Um, so the old tier system that I think uh, applies to everyone also is the same thing that has been um, implemented even in Africa, yeah. Um, so recently I got the, when they updated the old thing, then you have to basically um, carry out the old KYC update to your account. I got the message yesterday also that they've extended it to October 1st. Um, but so there are quite uh, a few issues aside from the one Felix has mentioned. Um, so yes, a lot of people are not bothered or worried about um, the KYC. That's a lot of people with good intent are not worried about KYC, right? But the problem is 
yes, there are some who do not have KYC, and then for some who have to do a certain volume, they have no problem with the KYC. But now it gets tricky because, as uh, I think it was uh, also Felix that mentioned, or uh, Malbach that mentioned, that um, there's a difference between uh, verifying on local Bitcoins and verifying locally within the country. So something like, uh, my license right my life my driver's license if i do decide that i want to put it up there actually i had to put it on local bitcoins because of the whole restrictions um but then when you get to the next layer which then request re requires addresses that gets a little tricky because um even if you have something valid uh there is a 50 50 chance that it will be validated correctly and then um, some certain uh, identification methods that are available within the country are not actually available outside um, generally. So we have something called the voters registration, uh, the voters ID card, which has no um, expiry date, basically, and that's not accepted outside the country. So that's what a lot of people have, even more than the driver's license, right? Uh, so now the the the. What interested me about BISC, I've always seen BISC on coin, uh, coin the dance, right? But what then made me take the extra step to get involved was basically the fact that because of the restrictions in LBC, it's obvious that yes, they're so big right now that they're drawing <clears throat> so much attention. And we know that Nigeria produces one of the highest volume daily uh, on local Bitcoins uh, and at present, the number of peer-to-peer, -peer, um, functioning peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, options within the country are not much. We have uh, we have uh, local bitcoins. We have Paxful, right? Those are the two top peer-to-peer, -peer, and Paxful presently is uh, is still going through the maturity phase, which local bitcoins already went through. So it's kind of tricky and uh, a landmine. A lot of times playing around there. Most of the others are centralized systems, right? Uh, we have um, um, uh, Luno, you have Remitano, the bunch of them, but they are all centralized. So BISC has a as a opportunity to provide something which local bitcoins wouldn't be able to provide. Um, have a lot of people who are actually affected by the cash. So for instance, someone that travels, so let's say for instance, anyone travels into Nigeria from let's say UK, US, China, and the person obviously doesn't have an account in the country here. Yeah? The person doesn't have, um, what's it called? Doesn't have a, cannot make use of their bank account and the person needs cash. Right, uh, the person would be easily would be able to in the past carry out a cash transaction and get cash to basically fund the the period of the stay. But this wouldn't be able to. This would this is no longer available through local bitcoins. So there are some there are some scenarios where um, uh, BISC should be able to take over, and then if it's able to um, basically expand would have um, so much effect uh, that, um, and the whole uh, mentality, once you have a few people using it, more people will come. So yeah, just uh, sorry for the rant, by the way. No, that's really cool, Anthony. Thank you for um, for that that overview and, and for being on the call. I do want to move on because we're getting a bit longer than I wanted, but I do have a quick I just, question. I mean, how does the... Not... How Go ahead, Steve, but I have a question for Anthony after. Okay. Um, I was just curious how the situation on the ground is with respect to meetups and, and is that something that's done there? Do people get together? Is there like an audience of people there to harness? You're on mute, by the way. Yes, sorry about that. Uh, sorry. Yes. So in terms of um, enthusiasts, right, um, there isn't much. Um, there isn't so much as uh, in other places. Uh, so what you have is more like few people who know each other and probably converse and stuff like that. But um, the meetups you get are basically people who are traders. Those are very common 
you probably get one every month or one every other month you have different traders meet up and then but enthusiasts are not so common uh so yeah that's the basic uh mentality around uh, sorry the basic state of things around the uh, meetups interesting okay Huey, do you have a question yes anthony how do people mostly interact with bitcoin do they have mobile wallets they have um, custodial wallets on okay computers but yeah so uh first things first Ethereum is interacted with more by the general people, right? Um, because it's easier, it's more accessible, right? You open up your Jack's wallet, you open up your um, your MetaMask now, you open up Opera, there's so many options. Um, but for Bitcoin specifically, um, for Bitcoin specifically, people make use of it, either make use of one of these exchanges, either the central or the uh, centralized ones or the peer-to-peer -peer, or for those who are lucky and have the opportunity they make use of coinbase right but i have a treasure right and there are also a few people so i'm actually a developer uh so a few people who also are uh, advanced a little i have hardware wallets among other things but most people use the uh coinbase um I think it was blockchain, blockchain.info, uh, among other things. Okay, thanks. Very cool. All right, so we have... Uh, actually, you know, sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. You know about the, the bounty, the market maker bounty for Nigerian Naira, right? Yeah, I saw that. Uh, uh, yeah, I saw that. You, you think, do you have any friends, other traders who, who might be interested in doing that? Uh, so I am actually going to be reaching out to some people, but I just wanted to first um, complete the first stage, which was basically get a trade going. Um, someone else showed interest recently. Um, so I think we're three now that are trying to see what we can do about that. I'm also in touch with uh, T. Akimbo. Uh, we spoke on Twitter. Um, so we're looking at trying to have something. Then afterwards, the I saw the bounty on the market making and definitely I'll be reaching out to people that uh, basically contacts, yeah. If you need help with anything, feel free to contact me. If you need some BSQ seeds to pay the fees or anything, let me know, okay? I'd love to see the first few transactions. Uh, so if I can help, uh, give me a shout on Twitter or Slack or whatever. Will do. Thanks. Yeah, that's awesome. Actually, if we could, I want to just skip to the last point real quick, uh, just so that we can keep the call useful for as many people as possible before we, uh, before we get to Brazil with Fabio. Um, so how to get started. So if you are someone like Anthony or, um, you know, someone else in another market, Brazil or Mexico or wherever, and you want to get this some traction in your market, in your currency, um, what can you actually do? So it really goes back to becoming a contributor for BISC in general. Um, you essentially do your research, determine a strategy. Uh, as you probably heard on this call so far, strategies will vary depending on the region and the market you're in. So um, hopefully you can take some insights from this call as to what's worked and what hasn't generally. Then once you, uh, I guess distill that information, pick what you want, pick what will work, add some of your own market specific stuff. Uh, you would wanna propose that to the network. So the best way to do that is to get in touch with folks on the Slack. So it's uh, this.slack.com, I think I can put a link to it, but the growth channel there is where you wanna go. It's where most growth people hang out. Um, just start some conversations there about what you're thinking, what you wanna do, and feedback on, on how to actually get started before you get started. Um, as you may know, BISC has a DAO, which provides uh, funding for work done on the network. So not only will getting feedback help you refine your strategy, but it will also help you gain favor for compensation when you do request it. Um, and as I mentioned at the very beginning, there are tools that we can provide for people looking to grow BISC in their market. Um, generally work is very self-directed, um, but 
for example, we've had a lot of people come through on Twitter and on Slack um, who are in various markets who run social media channels and whatnot that we can provide access to to help you magnify your message. Um, we have you know, a pretty considerable following on Twitter if you want to boost your message as well through there. Um, connections to people, intelligence. So as Wiz mentioned before, we just got, uh, we just recently uh, moved from horrible Google Analytics to our own self-hosted Matomo instance for analytics. So we have more control over, over that, privacy aware um, information on who's viewing what. So you can see uh, how well your campaigns are doing when you, do, when you implement them. Introductory materials, so we have a lot of good docs on our docs website, um, but if you want anything more focused, we're working on some posters and some leaflets, things like that for meetups, in-person events. Uh, chances are we can uh, help you with that as well. So uh, yeah, I highly encourage you to check out the, the Slack. Uh, talk with some people there, get some feedback on your ideas. Check out the docs page for uh, some materials there on what this gives introductory stuff there and yeah that should be i guess a good starting point and, and and also just if you want more of an idea on contributing to bisque in general there's probably a lot of overlap with growth contributing growth wise there we just did a call two weeks ago on that so uh, you can find out more information there the call is hosted on our youtube channel in the growth calls playlist, which is where this video will go once it's, once it's uploaded. So with that, um, I think that's the conclusion of our, like, of our main call, like general focus. Um, Fabio is a longtime user who just started contributing a few days ago, who made a, made a presentation to one of the, one of the big meetups in Sao Paulo in Brazil. Um, so he prepared a couple of slides on his perspective and experience on some initiatives to increase liquidity there. So for those of you interested in the Brazil markets, or if you're just interested in what he has to say as it may apply to your market, you know, feel free to stay online and uh, see what he has to say. Fabio, are you ready? Yes, yeah, I'm here. Cool. Uh, can I share the screen so I present my slides? Yeah, let me stop my share and then see if you should be able to. Do you have an option to share on your, your Zoom? Yeah, I have. Here we go. All right, perfect. Wait, can you everybody see and hear me properly? Yeah, I can. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So my first meaningful contribution to this was last weekend. Like, uh, Hui was, was talking to the, the meetup organizer and he prepared a video for them. And then in the last minute, I, I joined and said, look, actually, I can present there because I'm, well, I'm from Sao Paulo, even though I'm not there geographically. And I ended up doing another presentation and presenting to them and participating in a, a small debate of uh, decentralized exchanges at the end. And even though it wasn't a lot of people, the organizer and added me to a telegram group that has a hundred people who later introduced me to some other people who added me to some other telegram group who then added me to some whatsapp groups and now i'm just full of groups of brazilian bitcoin users and with that in mind i started doing some research about okay what could we do to bootstrap BISC in brazil because i i lived there a while 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 using bitcoin already and my impressions of, I have a few impressions of the market, but I never really sat down to write them down. So I made this presentation as just a quick walkthrough of what it is, and just to summarize these uh, findings. So the the market itself is, is quite a voluminous market. Last month in, in regular exchanges, they traded about 18,000 Bitcoin, 19,000 Bitcoin. And that's not even including local Bitcoins and any of the P2P market, not even the second largest exchange that they, they had some data issues and didn't report that to the, the website that aggregates them. So it's quite a, a big market. I don't know how many users exactly that means, but 
for 20,000 Bitcoin, that's, that must be quite fun. Another thing, Brazil has capital controls. So Bitcoin, even in the exchanges, it, it trades at 2.5% over overseas market in, in terms of dollar rate, rates. And it is a country that is not in a crazy uh, economic crisis like Argentina, but we do have our, our share of bad problems. So capital controls exist. Any transaction to, to out overseas is, is going to cost you 7%. Like no questions asked, just seven percent straight out of the bat, and that's one of the things that drives the prices up because that's one way that people can move in and out of the country with funds, and it is riddled with Ponzi schemes, like a lot of Ponzi schemes. When I joined the Meetup group, uh, the Meetup uh, on the on the Meetup website, it didn't take an hour to receive like two or three messages of people saying, "Hey, I have this coin that is." Uh, anchored in gold and you're going to participate and just send some money to this bitcoin address and let's go around it and not only that but following the bitcoin groups on facebook you just see scam after scam after scam it's really full of them uh a brief overview on the p2p market the main ways are local bitcoins and facebook and whatsapp groups on facebook people sort of develop their own brand and they start promoting themselves. So they, they create their own website and say, I am a P2P trader of Bitcoin and I have this uh, reputation on local Bitcoins and that's kind of what they, what they use. So to have an idea also of payment methods, on local Bitcoins, there are 81 open uh, sell offers, 78 are wire transfers because also like uh, Wiz said, in Japan, we do have relatively fast uh, intra-bank transactions in Brazil, but we, we do lack peer-to-peer -peer, uh, apps like PayPal. So like some people use it, but it's not that widespread. Mercado Pago is the, the local version of PayPal. It's literally the same story as PayPal. It was created by the local version of eBay to intermediate the trades within the website and it became a payment method. And Facebook is just complete crazy. Like it's a complete wild west where you can find all sorts of stuff. Like I, I found people selling Bitcoin for this pick pay payment method. I had never heard of it. And like doing some research like some small tiny startup in France, I think that found some niche market in Brazil. It, it's very weird. And like I said before, it's very based on reputation systems. Like I have a friend who went to school with me that he was doing peer-to-peer -peer trading. And one time I asked him, where does he get his clients from? And he says, well, I, I built a reputation on local Bitcoins and I've been writing it forever because I am not able to get any, in any new market that I try and I don't have reputation, I'm not able to get any, any business done. Uh, so much so that a lot of people impersonate these peer-to-peer -peer traders and they give them wrong WhatsApp numbers and then they, they do the scam. They do like a man in the middle type of attack using WhatsApp. Everything I arranged via WhatsApp too, that's very, uh, I think very unique. I've never seen that in any other place. And a lot of the trades seem to be one-off. Like somebody posts on the group saying, I have a hundred thousand bucks that I need to convert to Bitcoin. What peer to peer trader can give, can fulfill that order? Yeah, that's, that's the overview on Facebook. So thinking about that, I thought of uh, a concrete plan that we could execute to get more liquidity in Brazil. And first step, like uh, Wiz said, is finishing the localized translation. Like we have a lot of it translated to Brazilian and Portuguese yet, but I know that some strings are missing. And I want, also want to use the fact that it is not ready to create some, uh, some uh, FOMO, some fear of missing out for the meetup organizers and for the guys who I was introduced to. Like a lot of them are developers, so I can just start sending them, look, like it's on the master branch. If you download it and compile it yourself, you can test it out and that will give them possibly content and, and topic to discuss BISC on a, 
on the near future. Also, a very interesting thing is that a lot of people praise BISC in front of me saying, look, like I really like the work you guys do, but I don't trade there. And I'm still trying to crack that question and figure out why that is. But I, I'm still doing research on that to try to figure out. I'll, I'll come back with it when I have at least some answer. Then number two, I think we do need to create uh, some specific landing pages highlighting the positioning and the, the benefits of BISC. Because right now, if you go to BISC.network, it is a great page for an open source project. It explains what the open source project is and so on, but it's not a sales. It's not a, a pitch saying, look, this is a benefit you get from using BISC. Like you don't get to, for example, when people are arranging trades on WhatsApp, they don't even use an escrow. They, they blindly trust the person and the, the brand the person has, which is it's pretty crazy. Like if they were to use BISC, they, that problem is solved. You know, you have an escrow and you have an arbitrator. Like what else could you ask? And by, by personal experience and by anecdotal evidence, a lot of people in Brazil use Torrent. So trying to frame BISC as just like Torrent, but for Bitcoin, might be an, an easy way to get to to get them to realize that the switching cost is not that high. And I think it's also interesting that we include a couple of payment methods, not not necessarily to increase our tax surface or the risk that we have for for uh, fraud, but because some of them they are glamorized bank transfers but they are very interesting for branding. And later do outreach and go after each of the meetups groups. So in detail, uh, well, localized translation is happening in parallel. Localized landing page, like I said, it's good to highlight the buyer security, the local payment methods, and, and really focus on getting people to download the software. So the payment methods that I would want to propose, and I'm gonna write a proposal there and post it on GitHub, is we have this equivalent of uh, Revolut called Nubank, and they do instant transfers like Wiz has in Japan. And I spoke to a couple of friends at work in Nubank, and they said that uh, one of the main differences between internal transfers with them and with other banks is that first you can search a person for, by email, which is, way more friendly than searching them by social security number, also because social security number is a private information and people could use that for malicious purposes. And it is instant, 24-7, 365 days of the year. And they say no chargebacks are possible. So there is no, the, the risk is very low here. And then two other methods that I think are more for branding, just to say that we have, and they're not going to necessarily have a lot of volume, but is Mercado Pago, which is just the Brazilian flavor of PayPal. It works exactly the same way, and I'm pretty sure it has exactly the same policies with some minor modifications, like some uh, stricter uh, fraud detection and so on, because Brazil has way more fraud than the US. And one thing that I, I am not so sure about the history of gift cards and BISC, and I wanted to open this discussion up to, to the rest of the guys in this call, which is gift cards are a great way to convert cash into something digital. At least in Brazil, in every retail you go, you can buy gift cards for Steam or for the, the local payment processor that works with Steam. And you can basically buy gift cards for anything, like courses, restaurants, anything. So these are the methods I would want to propose and then later highlight them on the landing page to make sure people download the software. Then outreach, the, the, the first meetup with Sao Paulo was, they came to us, they came to, to Hui, and, and Hui gave the, the contact to Steve, who then, then spoke to me, and then I, I went talk to them. But if you take some of the largest cities, they have quite significant amount of members and some of them even have events scheduled for next week and the, the week after and we could go after them proactively 
by having the topic of discussing. Now BISC is translated to Brazil and Portuguese, and we have localized payment methods and use that as the, the main reason to get in the event and create awareness. Then there's also the YouTubers and podcasters. There's one guy there has a half a million subscribers on YouTube, and he's probably the guy who introduced most people to Bitcoin in Brazil. He is constantly talking about Bitcoin. I think at some point he mentioned BISC in one of his videos, but he never really went deeper into it. He's very accessible and he's always trying to promote ideas of self-sovereignty and freedom. So I think it's one of us reaches out to him and says, look, we have content for Brazil. Like we are ready to, to serve the Brazilian market. Can you give us some space? I, I'm pretty sure this guy would give us some space, maybe an interview in his channel or we would figure something out. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much the findings I had. And the fact that a lot of people know about BISC, but not a lot made the switch. So one of the traders I was talking to, he mentioned that, oh, I, I have all my trade, most of my trades done on OTC because I'm fine with the KYC thing, but it's always good to, to diversify the channels and have a Bitcoin that is not really tied to myself in, in KYC way. So it, it, it's hard to figure out exactly what is the value proposition that would entice them the most. Yeah, that was, that was it. Any questions, guys? Um, a not, um, very interesting um, presentation, uh, Fabio. So just a few comments. First was um, Brazil is pretty similar to Nigeria in terms of the system. And yes, gift cards is something that is pretty big. Uh, the biggest being um, iTunes card, even over here. And um, as for the connection, I do have a connection to BTC So, who is supposedly, I think is also one of the um, older people in BTC, basically Brazil and Portuguese oriented languages. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you do need that contact, I could uh, link you in. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and uh, yeah, very, very astute observations, by the way. Okay. Um, so my idea here is now write this as a proposal, post it on GitHub on the, the proposals channel uh, project and start, start getting to work. Like I would need, like it would be cool if anybody who's interested in helping me out on that, like the payment methods it would be cool to have somebody who knows at least some java in order not to fuck up things because my idea of making like cloning the the payment methods would be to look at some classes used for revolut and just change the the fields to to reflect the new bank style and, and the new bank fields that are required but uh, fabio about the payment methods i think there was uh somewhere a template so like a list of questions uh, mm -hmm. that you had to answer before adding a new payment method for not just yeah. uh, for the fields of information that you need to include, but also, yeah. for example, the proof of payment so that the arbitrators can can see if the payment was made or not. So I think that I, I think uh, I'll find that somewhere, but, but it was around. It was a list cool. already made. Yeah, that would be really nice because like all of these have those. It's just documenting it. And, and I did have some chats in the payment methods channel a while back when I was trying to discuss introducing some payment methods in Russia, but that would be really nice to have this list. Yeah, that would be, and it could be next to the outlist and asset because I think those go hand in hand. So you could put Sorry, the, the information next to the what assets? How to list an asset ah, okay. in the documentation. Okay, yeah. yeah, I think that's a great way. But 
Um, uh, really quick on the gift cards uh, mm -hmm. issue. Um, my understanding is that uh, for any new payment method to be added to BISC, there would be there would need to be a way for an arbitrator to resolve a dispute between the parties. So, for example, say you were going to buy a gift card from me using Bitcoin. Well, obviously, you can prove that you sent me the Bitcoin, but how can I prove that I sent you the gift card and I didn't send you like a bogus gift card or as soon as I sent you the gift card code, I, you know, redeemed it somewhere else. You know what I mean? Like there's a million yeah, ways to scan. So, I yeah, now that, uh, who you said mentioned about the documenting the proof of payments, it occurred to me that a gift card is very easy to dodge that. But, but yeah, yeah we, we can figure it out. If you combine that with the new uh, trade protocol where there is no arbitration and it's more of a uh, bonded, uh, uh, so for example, if I want to uh, have a trade limit of up to $10,000 worth of bonded trades, uh, you know, maybe I'm selling $100 gift cards or something, mm -hmm. I'm not going to, you know, I, I'm financially disincentivized from ripping people off because I've put my own money on the line to kind of keep me honest. So maybe something like that could work uh, where there is no arbitration. And this is, this is uh, very far down the road, obviously, like six months or a year out. But I think mm -hmm. with the current trade protocol, I don't think BISC would be able to do gift cards unless you know of some way to, you know, mitigate that risk or, or yeah. resolve a dispute. I think uh, that after research, I'm going to see if there's, there's any, anything done in that direction there, because I know there are many providers of gift cards. I think there are uh, ways. I, I have a couple of comments on this. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've looked into this briefly. I think there are some services where you can, you can initiate a gift card to be sent to an address uh, directly and then get like an email confirmation that it was done. Mm -hmm. um, the only issue with that is the chargebacks. I'm not sure. I didn't look deeply enough to see if, yeah. you know, if that's an issue. But um, yeah. So let me do that research for Brazil. See okay. if I can find any, anyone that works that way. Because but most of all, well, having this idea of the, the, the boxes that we need to check, like it needs to have a, a payment confirmation. Uh, it needs to be hard to charge back. It needs to, I don't know, have online uh, proof of something. That's, that's something I didn't have when I did this research. So that's a good point. Uh, yeah, so most of these gift cards are cash bought. And so only when you buy like an electronic gift card, I think could you set up that automated email thing. But yeah. what they do on Paxful uh, most of the time is they upload a receipt, a picture of the receipt uh, of the purchase of the gift card. And on the receipt, the paper receipt, it will say bought with cash. And then once the person who buys the gift card receives the code, they can plug it into Amazon.com or iTunes, and they can instantly verify that uh, the, the code is good. And then once they do press that enter button and have verified that it's good, then they go back to Paxful and they release the escrow, which gives the person the Bitcoin. So that's how it works uh, on Paxful. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... I wanted to make a few comments, which I forgot earlier on. So the first one is concerning the scam slash fraud. Um, so fraud, I think, is one of the big issues, basically, with uh, Bitcoin exchanges. I also suffered uh, something like that when I first started. So um, <clears throat> for somewhere like Brazil, um, which um, I don't know how much uh, advanced they are with fraud or how creative they are with fraud, I would think that uh, something as simple as um, being able to... Okay, so a few years ago in Nigeria, we had a problem where uh, through one of these payment services where you used your card to um, register, um, they were able, people were able to use another person's account to make transfers out of the person's account, right? That is reduced now, but it's still a possibility and there's always the possibility that something like that could always come up, whereby um, 
the person who has paid the Bitcoin gets to suffer. Uh, sorry, person who is selling the Bitcoin gets to suffer because the banks will most likely do a chargeback or whatever the case is, right? So that's one issue which I personally faced. Uh, there are other issues which include for the gift card, as you've mentioned, uh, it's both sides, the, the seller of the gift card uh, loading the gift card after sending it or the buyer loading it and then lying that they didn't receive it, right? Uh, mm -hmm. These issues are mostly solved using reputation. So when you see someone on Luka Bitcoins, for instance, when you see someone who's had 30, 70 trades, uh, well, my minimum that I trade with for safety is actually on rare trades. But when you see someone who've do who's done that many trades, you know the chances of them trying to repeat off is lower. Um, mm -hmm. Right. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing is um, during the presentation, Fabio, you mentioned um, that a lot of people know about BISC, but not many people use it. Mm -hmm. um, so I can speak to that from two points. The first point is basically UI UX, which you guys were discussing earlier before I joined. Um, too many steps. Mm -hmm. Too many steps, right? Uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys are aware of, right? Then the second, the the second thing is basically um, something like local bitcoins. Most people, a lot of people use their mobile devices, mm -hmm. right? Uh, something like local bitcoins. Anyone can log in and access the any of these exchanges, the central exchanges, even local Bitcoins, which is P2P, you're able to make use of your mobile device to access the interface and do what you need to do. But um, from what I've seen so far with BISC, you need to have the app running on your device, right? So um, until, thinking, the API, until the API is finished, and then you will be able to build mobile apps, which can be used to trade. Awesome. So, uh, so I think that's, sorry, when, when is the expected timeline for that? Is there an expected uh, timeline for that? I, I I don't I don't have a timeline for that. It's it's it was it's quite advanced, but uh, it does need a bit of a developer focus. And I think that the priority now is the uh, account signing process first. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would hope this year, but I can't I can't be sure of that. Ah, I see. Awesome. Okay, so um, that's the, so those are my two comments to the reason fewer people are making use of it because um, I, for one, have the letter. So anyone would have the letter G of switching from a system that already works mm -hmm. to a system, especially when the number of steps are more, right? Um, and especially with this new age that we are, it's just about pressing the big blue or green button and going to the next stage which is the system, the way everything is designed right now, right? So, and then the last thing is, um, in terms of the, um, the, 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 the payment methods, um, you mentioned the gift card, you mentioned the uh, bank, the two, yeah, the interbank transfer and then the Mercado, right? Um, I guess these are more than, they're mostly sufficient right mm -hmm. although they are now usually situations where they're uh um but they're edge cases so i think this are uh, actually sufficient for probably 80 percent to 90 percent of the population that would want to get on um on the exchange basically or that want to make use of the the exchange so yeah those were my comment cool anthony since you bring it up what is the most used mobile payment method in Nigeria? Okay, so in Nigeria, we are more like, uh, we like taking care of ourselves. So each bank has their own mobile uh, application, right? So there isn't a central application. The time the, there was an attempt to create a central application, which was a quick teller, uh, which I mentioned that there was a time that there was an app that you signed up using your um, card and that had some flaws. So people already ran away from such mentality. So we don't really have any any such um, within the country. It's basically the mobile app of the bank you're making use of and there are a number of banks, mostly. Yeah, Brazil has a similar pattern. It's each bank has very fast transactions within it but no bank talks yep. to each other. Yep. 
uh, but um, so 25, 30 minutes standard wait time for interbank um, transactions. But uh, of recent, of recent, it's been pretty good. Uh, so only on bad cases do you have transactions taking longer. But normally, uh, most of the transactions are below one minute now. Uh, but there are usually bad days where you could wait days for uh, you could wait hours for the transaction or uh, if it doesn't go through so we have this um, 24 hours policy where if the transaction doesn't go through uh, it has to be uh, reversed in the in 24 hours basically pretty cool all right well we've, we've gone on quite a quite a bit over an hour now uh, anybody have any last questions or thoughts uh, well, I'd like to book a meeting to to discuss this further. If anybody is interested in contributing, just hit me up. Hit me up on Slack, and we can arrange to to discuss. Maybe we can also use this template for other markets. Hi, this is BTC Pal Update. Um, I just wanted to do like a quick informal survey. I ran this thing called the BISC Trading Sprint uh, twice last week, and I was wondering if any of you. Um, were exposed to it and what she thought of it, uh, and if we're reaching just the uh, English-speaking market or like all the markets. So if I can just jump in, so I, I saw those those sprints and I love them. I think they're a, a really nice approach. They, it's it seems like almost like when I first saw it, I I thought that we were overthinking it. I, I think what you're doing is very simple and very but very very effective, possibly very effective. Um, my, my thing, my comment to you though, would be right now we're focusing on, on new markets right now, existing markets are in a bit of a tough situation with, uh, the scamming attacks we had back in March. I'm sorry. I meant to reach out to you about that, but we're trying to fly a little bit low with respect to existing markets for, uh, for that reason, mainly until we have uh, account signing in place and the new trade protocol in place that makes existing markets stronger, uh, at which point we'll be able to spend uh, more effort in growing them. But I, I, for one, love your idea and would love to do more of it at the right time. Okay, and I did run some advertising campaigns in some uh, newer markets. Uh, it seems like the most receptive to our the messaging was surprisingly Italy, number one, and um, it, it did stick a little bit in Brazil, but not as much as Italy for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was surprisingly hard in most, uh, uh, like what would be considered, you know, advanced economies like Japan. It, it, the, the, there was very low interest for BISC in, in uh, most, you know, so-called uh, first world countries. Um, also, uh, this is not directly related to, uh, marketing uh, new markets necessarily but um i arranged a meeting with this uh stefan who works at bitmex the uh derivatives uh, company for bit uh, for Bit the the illegal bitcoin derivatives market and uh what i'm the reason i want to first of all ask you guys since you're gathered here i, I know this is not directly re relevant to the uh schedule here but i wanted to ask your blessing before i meet with him and, uh, you know, I, I, I've noticed maybe we could benefit from having more developers and he might, I might be able to convince him to somehow supply additional developers, either pay them or convince them or something to join us. And if, if, if there are any other ways in which he could support our marketing efforts, basically, what do you guys think I should, should be uh, asking him whenever I do meet with him? So this this is a an, uh, an executive at Bitmax. He I don't know if he's an executive. He's uh, he's somebody. I don't I wouldn't I don't think he's an executive. Okay. Well, I I would certainly mention that if we ever get to the point that we can do derivatives markets on BISC, uh, they would be uncensorable and be open to the whole world. So that might be something that he's interested in. In fact, there was there was um, an initiative, well, an idea a long time ago put forward by Manfred uh, to do a sort of CFD 
um, thing on BISC. It's a bit soon for that, but uh, it's possible. I mean, once we get uh, fiat to Bitcoin working well in many markets uh, and Bitcoin to other uh, currencies, uh, it could be possible to list almost any kind of financial instrument on BISC. Okay, so I will tell him that I wasn't aware that the uh, technology would permit, you know, some something as complicated as as uh, CFDs and derivatives. But I, I, if if you guys are confident that we could eventually incorporate that, I will bring that up as a possibility to, when I meet with Stefan. Well, CFDs are a bit more complicated, but simple options would be very easy to do on BISC. You just need a double escrow, right? So, for example, a binary option, and I know this is way off topic, but a binary option where each trader deposits 50, uh, whatever, 50% 50 of the total payout, and one of them receives the whole payout, depending on which way the market goes, would be quite simple to code. Okay, I will pitch that. I'm actually familiar with binary options and a number of different ways of implementing them. And uh, that's pretty exciting. I think if we could somehow have cooperation, because in terms of uh, idealism and values, I think BitMEX aligns mm -hmm. like 90% with what uh, BISC is trying to achieve. Can I suggest one thing? Anyway, that's all I have to say on that. <laughs> so I think when you meet with him, one cool tactical thing that you could ask, but only once we have the, the new trading protocol in place, is for BitMEX Research to do a piece on BISC or something, because I know that they drive a lot of, they do very in-depth research pieces in their blog, and it gets spread a lot. Actually, they already recently did um, an essay on, not an essay, they actually did some sort of study, and Manfred re replied to it, but they, uh, it, it was kind of a bit above my head, but they were saying something like you could create virtual options in BISC right now just by screwing around and, and setting up certain kinds of orders. And then Manfred uh, rebutted them and argued that there, there was a flaw in the argument they were making. But anyway, they, they have brought some attention to BISC already in, in an article. They, that, That's uh, cool. Then I'm going to search for that. And can you share sure, uh, I can that. this print thing that you mentioned in the beginning? Uh, where can I find that? I'm sorry, which thing was that? You you started your your talk talking about a sprint something. Oh, the BISC sprint. Um, yeah, I'll hyperlink that. Uh, one moment, please. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, it's a really cool initiative. Basically, just like you you said, what what he did was he made a tweet saying. Uh, first person to make, what is it? I think it was two trades to complete two trades on BISC wins. And there was a yeah, cash yeah. prize or it was a Bitcoin prize. Uh, it was, it I, was I, it, uh, 30 bucks, I think worth of Satoshi's via bottle pay. And then the second time you did like a hundred bucks. It was, I mean, it was not small amounts of money. Correct. But we only had one applicant for each of the two contests. So, you know, I, I, maybe it's because the minimum trade size on BISC I was thinking might edge up and eat into the, the profit of the prize winner or something. Well, yeah, that and maybe that, but also we, we had pretty much no uh, kind of coordination or lead up to it. It was pretty much you tweeted and I retweeted and we just kind of hoped for the best. But uh, I think, I think with, a, with, with the, right, the right lead up and the right sort of um, coordination beforehand, I think it could be a really good... Really good, really good initiative. Cool. All right. Um, should we call that? Uh, should we call that it for now? Any other lingering questions or comments? I'll post these links if anyone wants to stick around. Cool. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll save a transcript of the chat because there is some good stuff in there, so that we can. Uh, post it later on so it's not lost. All right, well, if that's it, then uh, thank you all for joining. I think it was a, definitely a longer call than I wanted, but I think we got some good conversation, good, good perspectives from all around the world in, and hopefully we can use it to grow some new markets on this in the coming months. Thank you all for joining. Take care. Thank you.